in Mark 10, we have the story of blind Bartimaeus. And this is what he does, the beggar. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I'd like to introduce you to one of a very ancient little devotional exercise. It's called the Jesus Prayer. Now, if any one of you want to uh, um, uh, do any further reading on this or material on this, there's a lovely little book in the library on this that I can um, uh, refer you to. The Jesus Prayer is very simple, and it's very, very common in the uh, Eastern tradition, um, but also increasingly in the West. Um, it's what I have up here. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, there's two ways of doing this, uh, and you keep on praying it to yourself over and over again. The first one is to synchronize it with your breathing. Um, as you say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, imagine you're pulling air in through your belly button with deep breathing, holding your breath, and then have mercy on me, a sinner, as you expel the air. Um, the trick of it is to get a kind of a circuit going, a kind of a flowing like that, if you can get the idea. Um, uh, but instead of just breathing very shallowly with your, diaph with your ribs, to use your <coughs> diaphragm for deep breathing. Um, deep breathing, um, people found, is one of the best ways of relaxing. If you're tense, the simplest way of just unwinding is <coughs> just to practice deep breathing. You know that uh, there's a connection between breathing, breath, ruach, and spirit. Um, uh, now, that's one way of praying the Jesus Prayer. Um, let's do that. There's another way, which I'll tell you to, which is to synchronize it with your heartbeat. Um, so remember, this is a beggar's prayer uh, in the presence of Jesus. Let's then pray to Jesus, who is present with us. Lord Jesus Christ, 
Son of God, have mercy on us, sinners, and give us your Holy Spirit and all that we need today. Amen. I assume Tom's still unwell, is that the case? Yes. I'd like to do some um, concluding work on biblical teaching on subordination. Now remember subordination, um, the basic word in Greek has the idea of order and fitting into God's order of things. Not human order, not any old order, but God's holy order. Um, and there's three basic orders that God has established according to the New Testament. The family, government, in the broader sense, and uh, uh, then the church. Now, um, uh, just a bit of concluding work. Uh, the reasons that are given for subordination are very interesting. First of all, the first reason is, since we are in Christ, therefore we are to be subordinate. So this is, this is not a non-Christian teaching, this is Christian teaching. Since we are in Christ, united with Christ, belong to Christ, uh, therefore subordination follows out of that. Just as Christ is subordinate in one sense to his Father, does the will of his Father, um, so we are subordinate uh, in Christ. Um, and uh, then the second reason closely related to that we are subordinate to Christ remember the relationship between husband and wife is compared to the relationship between uh, Christ and the church um, just as the church is subordinate to Christ so wives are to be subordinate to husbands that's the right order so it's subordination to Christ subordination for Christ's sake um, in this we follow the perfect example of Jesus. Um, according to uh, Luke's Gospel, Jesus, um, as a young boy, went home after his uh, uh, trip down to Jerusalem for his bar mitzvah when he was probably 11, 12 years old, and he was subordinate to his parents. He practiced subordination. Even though he was God's son, he was subordinate to his human parents. Um, so uh, um, Christ is the perfect example of what subordination uh, involves. Now you don't get no uh, notions of subordination from politics or even from human family kind of thing. Um, subordination mirrors uh, the pattern of relationships within uh, the Holy Trinity. Uh, we uh, follow the example of Christ. Fourthly, and this is very interesting, um, true subordination um, is one of the most powerful witnesses to God our Saviour. If you think of it, um, the subordination of children to parents, wives to husbands, citizens to rulers, um, uh, Christians to leaders, that kind of proper subordination, um, is a very powerful mission tool. It bears witness to God's order of things. And remember that wonderful picture um, that uh, uh, Foster has about subordination involves what he calls the revolution downwards. The God who is king, Christ who is king, comes to serve others. Um, puts himself in the most lowly position, which in fact is the highest position. Next, um, it makes for a good conscience before God. Um, living with a good conscience is living not rebelliously, um, uh, but living subordinately. 
uh, Romans particularly connects this with our, our proper subordination to um, leaders within government. Um, so you can live with a good conscience as a citizen if you practice proper subordination and do what's required of you as a citizen. However, the last one is the one that interests me most of all, and it's, it's, it's rather surprising. Can you turn to Ephesians chapter 5, 19 through to 21? Nineteen through to twenty-one. Uh, Nathan, do you have it there? Ephesians five. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth. No, that doesn't sound right. Ephesians five. Ephesians. Yes, try again. Yep. Uh, Ephesians five uh, nine. Yes. Uh, let the, pick up at verse eighteen. Do not get drunk. Yes. Right. Okay. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Um, and then you go, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, etc. Now, once again, I've explained, I don't like the translation there, submit. Um, uh, I don't think that does justice to it. But there's something very interesting here in the Greek that doesn't come through in that translation. First of all, it begins with a passive imperative. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, um, watch out in the New Testament for passive imperatives... In a sense, they are nonsensical. You can tell somebody to do something, but a passive imperative, you're telling somebody to have something done to them. Now, behind passive imperatives lies what? Who's the subject here? God. God. Right? This is a case of what scholars call the divine passive. Uh, let God fill you with his spirit. So be filled with the Spirit, and then you get a chain of participles which comes out of that. Um, speaking to one another in all wisdom, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, um, always and everywhere giving thanks. And then, um, if you follow the Greek, there's another participle, um, subordinating yourselves out of reverence for Christ. Now, um, most translations separate this from the previous, grammatically, and take this as a participial imperative, and so give a new imperative, but in fact, it is a chain of participles coming out here. Okay? Um, uh, what will happen if you are filled with the Spirit? You will speak the word of God to each other. You will sing and make melody in your hearts. You'll always give thanks to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be subordinating yourselves to each other, one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, um, this is plural, not singular, so it has to do with the congregation, the church. In the church, one of the marks of being filled with the Spirit is that people practice subordination as appropriate. All of this here, you plural be filled with the Spirit uh, right through. Watch out. Uh, uh, in, in English, for the second person, we don't distinguish singular and plural. And in our modern ear, we read uh, the plurals always as individual singular. Almost always in Paul's letter the you's are you plural not you singular. This is one case in point. So it's corporate speaking, not individual speaking. That doesn't exclude that personal individual stuff but it, it's basically corporate in orientation. Okay, um, uh, ending now uh, uh, with two points before I get to the where we began last week. 
I'd like to make you aware of something which is very much neglected in modern times, and that's part section 9 of Luther's small catechism. Um, it's interesting that usually people end with section 6, which has to do with confession and absolution. You're lucky even if you get there. Um, you don't get to uh, 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 Luther's morning and evening prayers. You don't get to the graces before and after meals, um, let alone what was called the table of domestic duties. Um, now, have a look at the way Luther puts it here. It's, to some extent, uh, it's not taught it's anymore because it's rather unfashionable. And anything that's unfashionable, we tend to sideline in the church. Um, but Luther put great emphasis on this. He says, as a title to this section, and you can look it up in your catechism yourself, the household chart. Now, what he had assumed was that these Bible passages which follow would be written on an um, elaborate chart with pictures on it, in which you had um, uh, these Bible passages so that people could read them, memorize them, and so that these words would be in their houses. I don't know if you've seen these catechism charts. Um, okay, uh, there's copies of them in the library. You can see these, these are, are, sometimes they're just black and white. And then you also have these wonderful paintings. We have the whole catechism or parts of the catechism in elaborate pictures where people could both see it and read it and memorize it. This is one of the charts that Luther says. Okay, the household chart of some Bible passages for the various holy orders and stations for admonishment with its teaching for each one in its office and service. Um, so this Bible passages which have to do with holy orders and stations within holy orders and then the teaching in these passages for um, uh, the office within these orders and the service that's to be given within the station within these orders. Now this is classical Luther teaching um, and uh, makes good sense of what I've been doing. There's four words here that are very significant. By the way, this is translated terribly in both in Tappet. Um, Kolb Wingert is a little bit better. Um, Kolb Wingert nearly gets it right. But Tappet just evaporates the whole thing. Um, number one, Luther speaks about holy orders. Now, he has in mind um, what was regarded as the holy order in medieval times. When in Luther's day, in the Catholic Church, if you spoke about holy orders, what would you think of? Um, priesthood. priesthood and what was the other holy order related to the priesthood? Monasteries. Monasteries. So you had two kinds of ways of life. Uh, you could enter holy orders by becoming a priest or a monk or a nun, and then you'd live a holy life. And then there were other social orders which were not holy orders, secular orders. But here Luther picks up that medieval teaching and extends it um, beyond the church into the family and into public life, government, um, civil society. So holy orders, a holy order is a divinely ordained institute for holy priestly service. It's the place where you act as a priest and do holy work serving God in this holy order. Now, uh, as you know, Luther teaches that uh, quite correctly from the New Testament that there are three holy orders. What are the three holy orders? Where you do holy work as priests? Church, family, Church, family and society. society, yes, government, yes. What we'd call uh, uh, civic society these days in our democratic thing. The second word there is station. Now, the station is your location within the order. Take, for example, the family. What's my station within my family? Well, I'm a father, a son, uncle, husband, brother. Can you see? All, all of those have particular 
uh, responsibilities attached to it, right? That's the station within the order, that's the location within the order, and then office has the idea of a position of leadership responsibility. Some of those stations are leadership positions. That's what Luther means by office, medieval terms. So um, I am in the office of father and grandfather and husband. Right? That's position of leadership, a position of responsibility, a duty, you could put it in modern terms, a duty for, of spiritual care for people um, in my uh, order. And then service is the tasks that you do according to your station and vocation. So uh, my service then, how do I serve my children as a father or my grandchildren as a father within that holy order? Um, do you get the conceptual thing very clearly? By the way, this helps you very, uh, very much if you get this very clearly in your mind in Lutheran ethics. Uh, Luther's ethics is basically uh, built around these uh, very, very helpful um, uh, biblical concepts. And then what's interesting, he gives a list of passages, just Bible passages. So you have a list of Bible passages which teach you um, what your duty, what your responsibility, what your service is in your station, vocation, order, all that kind of stuff. Um, so first of all, you have church, the duties of bishops, pastors, and preachers. Then you have your duty within government. Um, Chris, probably better civic society, your public duty. What's your duty as a citizen within a community? Um, and then you have uh, family, the duty of a husband to a wife, wife, husband, parents, children, servants would say m workers, masters, mistresses, in modern terms it would be employers, so employees, um, young people, um, and widows. It's interesting that widows are touched on here because in, uh, up until modern times, women outlived men by decades. And you still get it, for example, in some Indian communities, I know it's the old pattern, um, but it's not so common, I found, in Malaysia to find Indian men over the age of 50. I don't know if that's the case in India, whereas you have a lot of women who are 70 and even 80. Right? Um, uh, there's also... What? 60 men. It's basically 60. 60 is... It's, it's gone up, say, 10 years or so. Okay? And then what's interesting is the um, footnote. And then he has, after those, can you see, he, there's, uh, there are the three orders here, and then there's the stations within the order, there's the uh, uh, officers within the order, and then he generalizes, he says, all, each person in his or her community. So thinking communally now. Now what's our overall responsibility, he puts two passages there, love your neighbour as yourself, um, for in this all the commandments are summarised. That's number one. And then he picks out a phrase from 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, I urge you first of all that Petitions, prayers, supplication, and thanksgiving be made for all men, all people. Now, um, notice that this is the general duty that's required of everybody. And Luther here is thinking in terms of us as priests. I, as a priest, have two overriding uh, responsibilities in my order, station, vocation. Um, on the one hand, I bring God's love to every person that I meet. So I serve others in love. And subordination, if you like, has to do with love. And it's for it possible for com people to live in community and to love one another. So it's for the delivery of love, if you like, from God to others. 
Um, on the other hand, as a priest, I'm called to do what? Pray. To pray for those people, and particularly those people who are in, around me in my order, station, vocation. So you have those two sides. So um, you have the duty of spiritual care, if you like, that in cuts across all orders, all stations, all vocations. Any questions on that? That shouldn't be anything particularly new. Um, but there's a lovely resource here in the Catechism that I don't think is used anywhere near as much as it could be used. Okay, just to go back where we were uh, at the beginning of this course, um, I mean the beginning of this unit, um, no, doing a spiritual check of your health. The first question I raise, I ask myself again and again is what's my attitude to worship? Um, what's my attitude number two to authority? Both those over me and those for whom I am responsible. Those to whom I am responsible and those for whom I'm responsible. Um, so who, to whom am I subordinate? Uh, whose head am I? Okay, now the next question is the question of my conscience. But before I go start off that, um, any uh, questions about the whole issue of subordination? You can see that in some ways it's very, very countercultural, and it's difficult to teach this without getting people's backs up and without them drawing the wrong conclusions. Um, but I think... Uh, we have a great resource here in the church, which maybe uh, will be rediscovered in the future and you'll be able to use. And the important thing is not so much being able to use, but you teach it by practicing it yourself. Yes, Vaughan? Just a comment, basically, that it struck me in that Ephesians 5 passage yes. that um, one of the fruits of being filled with the Spirit, yes. it just sticks out like a claim in verse 21, be subject. To one another, and for yes. I wasn't expecting that. That's right. Um, yeah. Clinic principle: look for the unexpected, and you can see why translators draw the line across here because it doesn't seem to fit. Um, it is so countercultural in our uh, whole way of thinking um, that the mark of being filled with the Spirit is subordination. And I think what Paul indicates there, it's only if you are filled with the Spirit and by the power of the Spirit that you can truly subordinate yourself to others uh, in a godly way. Yes? Um, just a question that I had thinking about from what we talked about was um, whether you could just expand a little bit more on, when, on your reference to this um, subordination being a good mission tool or witness to, to our culture today? Yes. In, in what way? And, um, yeah, just, just have a quiet for that one. Um. Can you go, oh, let's have a look at two passages, rather than me guess on, let's do scripture. Uh, can you go to 1 Peter chapter 3, where you get one reference to it. And uh, by the way, um, uh, this is, uh, uh, I've seen this happen again and again. Since it's your question, chapter 3, verses 1 and uh, 2, please. This is talking about wives. Instead of Submissive there, just read subordinate if you don't have it. Likewise, wives, be subordinate to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. I do, when they see the respectful and pure conduct, they win over their husbands without a word. Look, one of the big problems that I've encountered as a pastor is where you get one, usually it's the wife who's church going, at least traditionally, the husband doesn't go to church. There's all sorts of problems with most Australians and men about uh, going to church. And so you get a marriage where you get a, a Christian girl marrying a non-church going guy. Now, this is something that grieves any Christian wife uh, more than anything else and makes life difficult for her uh, because you know, she goes to church, hubby left at home and he doesn't like that and makes life difficult for her. 
unless he's a very good guy. Um, and uh, the temptation then is for that wife to try and uh, win him over in some in the obvious way. What's the obvious way? Words. With words. And picky, what kind of words? Angela, the preacher of the gospel. Yes. Uh, and what does he hear? Even if she thinks she's evangelizing him, he hears it as? Nag. Nag. nag, nag, nag. And what happens then? He gets his back up, and it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, or... Um, if, she, if she's really canny, she'll use the one uh, powerful tool she has, which is to play the sexual game into it. And if he goes along, comes to church, she will reward him sexually. And uh, if he doesn't, then she goes cool, unresponsive. And that happens quite common. How effective do you think that is? It's, it's a loser's game, that one is. It just doesn't work. It can't work. It won't work. Notice what Paul says here. Um, can you read it again? Um, and, uh, yeah, verses 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subordinate to your own husband, so that even if they do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Respectful, pure conduct, which means honouring them, um, their, their, their conduct. Uh, when they see that their marriage is better off because the wife goes to church, because she prays, uh, then they will be won over without a word. Um, that's one place where you get this... Um, uh, top. And that's most obviously the case, where subordination wins over. Um, the other place where it's touched on is Titus. Titus chapter 3. Let's, can we get to the... Now, did I... Am I right, or was it somewhere else? Yeah, um, Titus 3, verses 1 and 2 is implied there. Um, can you... Uh, um, oh, uh, yeah, Titus 2, 9 through to 10. Um, who's, who's got it there? Ben, do you have it? Ben's got it. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Saviour attractive. Are it slaves making the teaching of God our Saviour attractive? How? By them being subordinate to their masters. And then it explains how they are subordinate to their masters. If you think of the employment situation, um, no. If you get a good worker um, that uh, practices proper subordination, um, in the long run will win over, can win over, and can, or at least can make Christianity attractive to the most hardened boss. I know that's if you put in that situation. Um, you know, uh, can you see? That's helpful. That's Likewise, uh, I've seen it happen. Um, as you may know, uh, for 11 years before I came here to seminary, I was a high school chaplain. And um, uh, already at that time, there were a number of children who became Christians. Uh, some couldn't be baptised because their parents wouldn't allow them to. Others, you know, could, the parents allowed them to, but they, their parents gave them heaps because they became Christians. Now, that was very difficult for young Christians who are 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, um, particularly if mum or dad says you're not allowed to get baptised. And they would be then tempted to say, OK, well, let's get baptised in secret. I say, no, I won't baptise you unless you have your parents' permission. You don't do anything behind their back. Um, now, how can children like that win their parents over? It's not by being rebellious to their parents, but by 
by subordinate. And then notice that uh, the fourth commandment is honour your father and your mother by honouring parents, winning them over. Um, and I could tell a number of very nice stories of how this happened over a period of time. It doesn't always happen. I could tell you a num number of stories where it didn't happen. Um, but, you know, they could get baptised then when they came of age and uh, in that way. Um, winning over by proper subordination and everything that involved to, uh, within the family. Um, I can think of a number of cases where you had a split family. You had, say, father, mother, and say two or three or four children. One became a Christian, and the one became a Christian then was victimised by the anti-Christian parents and picked on and discriminated against. Um, but then as time went on, particularly when parents got old, guess what happened? The, children, the child or that had been a Christian was the only one that stood by mum and dad in old age and eventually won them over just by their honouring their parents and loving their parents and not repaying evil with good. I mean, evil with evil, but repaying evil with good. I had a bit of a shortcut there. Another case where that's mm. so. Do you get the basic picture? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's something that... It's one of those things that I've known like, intuitively in my own relationships and those sort of things. Yes. It's, that's really helpful to have it. Um, um. Now, magnify that throughout the whole of our society. And this, this, as far as I'm concerned, is one hidden dimension to evangelism that waits to be discovered. Um, and can you see, it's not very popular. Uh, we think everything depends on what we say to win people. The most important witness, the most important tool of evangelism is these two things. Just loving people in our station vacation, and particularly people that are not terribly lovable to us. Uh, on the other hand, then, uh, praying for them. Um, that's the secret, I think, for evangelism in our society, where our words are cheap and people don't react well to Bible bashing and to verbal witness. Vaughan, you had your hand up. Yes. Did you? Oh, oh, was your red card? No, oh, sorry, yes. Sarah, Julie. I was um, just wondering in an employee employer situation, when you as a Christian do this but it doesn't work or things happen and you leave with bitter taste in your mouth or whatever, yep. um, how can you rectify any of the situations when you've been subordinate to employees or whatever? Mm. But um, This is no formula to win your employer. No. Um, but who knows what the effect of this will be in the long run. Even if it's not your employer, you know, one, I don't know whether you realise of how much people who are not Christians keep an eye on those who profess to be Christians. And don't look at what they say, but look at the way they behave. And note the way they behave. Um, and particularly in situations where they're t dealt with unjustly, if they go on a crusade to get justice or uh, payback or vengeance in some way, okay, they write them off. But the most powerful witness is, well, you don't go down that way. Uh, there's many, many stories that could be told, not so much in winning over the boss, but winning over fellow workers. Uh, uh, in this way and appreciating that. Um, the way they go and seeing that there is another way than the way of the world in dealing with uh, injustice. Um, now this is not, not a recipe for getting promotions or for winning over a boss and getting a good work situation. In fact, uh, it usually tends the opposite direction. You get it in the neck, uh, usually. Yes, Vaughan? It's also very, uh, it, it kind of seems obvious but it's so hard. Yes. It's so hard because I think, you know, uh, culturally we, we expect things now. We want quick, we want quick results and this yes. requires a lot of patience. Yes. And then secondly, I think, you know, we want to be acknowledged and uh, by, maybe perhaps by what you're saying, by the words that we speak yep. and this, you forego all that stuff yep. in this yep. time. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to be popular. It's hard to be popular. Um, still remember a, a graphic uh, time in my life. Um, when I was university and first couple of years at seminary, during the holidays I would first of all, you know, this is before bulk handling of grain, so bag shut, you know this Murray, and then uh, once that was finished then I'd go and work on the local siding, a place called Cook Plains. You know, the grain would be put there and big, great big stacks, and once the stacks had been made then they had to be roofed so that the grain wasn't spoiled. Um, I'd get a the second part of the summer holidays, I'd get a job working together with a guy called Trevor Gregory, who was, in, who was the a local grain agent. Um, now, he knew I was studying to be a pastor, and uh, he was one of your hard-bitten, hard-living, uh, uh, Australian guys and he had no time for the church he said they're a bunch of bloody hypocrites and um, you know year after year he'd get stuck into me and he would really niggle me one way or the other and I uh, uh, tried to take it and I think generally succeeded in good humor and turn it around and make a joke of it um, and uh, you know that continued for about three years and every, every, every season he'd get stuck into me and there's always a bit of an edge to it. Um, then the last, at the end of the last season that I worked for him, uh, he called me in and he says, I'll oh, come around to the shop and collect your cheque. I went around there and had a look at the cheque and the cheque was double what was due to me. And I said, look, Trev, you've made a mistake here, mate. Uh, I didn't work all these hours. Uh, according to my calculations, let's say it, sh he, it should be $1,000 rather than $2,000. And he says, no, no, that's right, that's right. Um, you're a good bloke. And I enjoyed working with you. <laughs> and then, just as I was about to leave, he says, hey, when, uh, you know, um, you won't mind saying one for me every now and then. Now, he was an atheist asking me to pray for him. Uh, I didn't do any witnessing at all, except, you know, when he had a go at me, and, uh, you know, but then it was just basically saying the obvious things. Um, but he had been watching me, he'd been sizing me up uh, far more than I ever realised, and that was evident than right at the end. And he just wanted to say he appreciated what I'd done, that I'd worked hard, and that I had uh, treated him with respect and all that kind of thing. Um, and he wanted me to use my uh, in with the boss to put in a word for him. <laughs> now, he understood the language of, you know, the whole language of subordination and everything that involved. Um, you know, I could have gone and got stuck into him quite easily and rolled him up and he's a, he was a very fiery character so uh, it would have been very easy to give to stir him and to be insubordinate and to chuck off at him. Yep. And you see then the detrimental effects of the of places where you develop these Christian subcultures where you never then have those opportunities. Yes. Because, because evangelism is seen as you know door to door or yes. you know, preaching on the street corner or whatever and, and then you do your work you know for your Christian boss with you. Christian white pages and that sort of thing. Yes. And then um, it just, you just completely miss this whole dimension of uh, um, witness. Yes. And I think with our society becoming less, with the Christian culture being stripped away, which is a bit of a veneer in any case, um, uh, uh, the situation of you know, witness will be much more clear. Um, if you read a lot of the stuff in the early church, what the fathers say in the church, they make a great deal of all this, what I've been talking about, in terms of the witness of Christians to their pagan neighbours. And they add one thing, which is, is, is uh, I think, going to become increasingly the case. Um, uh, according to some pagan writers, say around about 2nd, 3rd century, you could tell in any village or town whether a person was a Christian or not a Christian just by their attitude towards sex. Now, there was just such a difference between pagan attitudes towards sexuality and Christian attitudes towards sexuality that it stood out like that. And people could pick it. Uh, reading people sexually and the way they treated 
uh, each other sexually as being the most powerful witness possible. And according to much evidence, there's lots of people that became Christians in the ancient world because of uh, this, what I call sexual witness. Do you know, understand what I mean? Now, hus the way husbands treated their wives, um, the way Christian men treated women generally, the way women were you know, treated men, um, or a simple thing like Christian girls would remain virgins until they were married. Uh, the valuing of virginity, you know, those kinds of things, which from a pagan society was stupid, uh, was valued and people were attracted to that as an alternative to a rather rapacious, sexually exploitative uh, society where despite its accent on sexuality basically uh, diminished uh, the value of human sexuality. Yes? One more question. Yes. Subordination. Yes. Um, and uh, not using words. Uh, yes. Of apologetics. Yes. Um, um, is that then apologetics then when we're asked the question, we're asked to give an account? Yes. Um, but otherwise we don't try and... Like the guy was ripping you in the car. Yes. Right? Yes. It could have been an opportunity to give for apologetics. Yes. Right? Yes. But, um, we're quiet, we take it, we order ourselves. Yes. I'm just trying to... Yeah, um, see, it's, it's for you as pastors, that's not going to be the basic thing, but you, you'll have to teach this in some way, and you'll need to teach it quite concretely. Say, um, you, it'll come to you with a, 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 a young person who wants to get become a Christian, but the parents don't approve of it. Okay, there's your chance. Um, I... Christian woman says, look, I'm worried about my husband. He doesn't come to church. What can I do? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I point her to, you know, the passage of Ephesians, subordination there. And what does subordination mean? Respecting a husband. Go to First Peter, winning over without saying a word, just by your behaviour. And Peter goes on to talk about a quiet, gentle spirit. Um, uh, that's that's uh, winsome and wins over the hardest hus husband. Uh, it's context. It's context that most of the teaching is going to be, but there's no harm in putting it out front, um, particularly with Christians. So I think Christians, uh, you can put this in to them because it's biblical and they'll take it. If you can show it's biblical. But um, there's no way that you can put this out on a non-Christian context where they won't misunderstand it and misrepresent it. No? So uh, a lot depends on the context, but don't be intimidated by uh, the fact that it's not popular, therefore you shouldn't teach it to Christians. Um, I've been astonished at some times where I've taught this up front, how grateful, I expected negative reactions almost always, but how grateful Christians have been for the teaching. Provided it's balanced, and provided that it's biblical. Okay, so let's have a break before we, and then move on.